In the weather today, another multi-vortex wedge tornado, this time in southwestern Oklahoma, last night near Altus. These photographs provided by Bill Hark, a well-known chaser from Virginia. He was out there. Many others were on the storm, too. We saw at least 215 knots of gate-to-gate -gate shear on the WSR-88D. From what I can tell, this was only exceeded by five other events in history. Keep in mind these are not absolute records. They're dependent on radar range and elevation in the storm. The sampling size of the radar is rather large, and that's why we need the mobile platforms, the Doppler on wheels, and other research activities there to see what's really going on down in the lower levels. Anyway, let's take a look at the weather for today. We find a cold front this afternoon moving through Missouri, Oklahoma, and Texas. Behind it, drier air with dew points in the 30s and 40s. The dry line being undercut by that cold front, the triple point around San Angelo, and the tail end of that dry line, pretty much right there into Mexico, where we've got some very warm temperatures this afternoon. Yeah, that's 110 degrees right there. We also had 111 the past hour at Monterey and 108 at Monclova. And that heat wave has been going on for at least a week. You can also see some very dry air behind the dry line, dew points down below zero at Marfa. Out ahead of the dry line, there's that fetch of very rich moisture. The dew point temperature is running about 76 all through southeast Texas. That is some very sultry air. Up to the north, we have another triple point in southwestern Wisconsin. The warm air flowing all the way up into the Madison area. That slight risk area from the Storm Prediction Center, rather extensive, all the way from Indiana down towards Dallas. A couple of enhanced areas around Quincy, Illinois, and from Muskogee down to Dallas and Lampasas. Going up to 300 millibars, at about 30,000 feet, a broad area of troughing across the western half of the country and some rather strong flow in the base of that trough, looking at about 70 to 90 knots across much of Colorado, New Mexico, and into the Great Plains. And at 200 millibars, that flow strengthens up to 100 knots. That's a pretty good indicator of a subtropical jet. You've got the anticyclonic characteristics also, there's considerable southward extent down into Mexico and into the Gulf of Mexico as well. And what we're going to see over the next week is continuation of this active weather pattern. Then things start shutting down going into midweek next week. You can see this big ridge building across the Rockies as we go into Wednesday. Then for Thursday and Friday, a definite weakening of flow in the central and southern plains. Still hanging on to those strong winds up there in South Dakota, North Dakota. That's going to be associated with the northern branch of the polar front jet. The subtropical jet lurking down to the south, but nothing like what we have right now. And then it looks a little bit more like summer as we get into the extended period. And in fact, yeah, that's going to be June 3rd. So this is about what we would expect going into the final weeks of spring. So let's take a look at the precipitable water going into this weekend and next week. This is pretty important during the warm season because this is tied in very closely with flash flood potential and also with the development of large convective weather systems. Also, a few features we can see where we have gradients starting to show up. That's often a reflection of upper level forcing. So that tells you a little bit what's going on in the upper levels. So as we go into tomorrow, Substantial moisture available down in the Gulf Coast region, 1.5 to 2 inches. Then we see moisture return starting in the southern plains. So for tomorrow's moderate risk, which is basically in this area, moisture is feeding northward 1 to 1.5 inch and even as high as maybe 1.75 out there in Oklahoma. So anyway, the moisture is going to gradually shift eastward as we get the next Aeroclinic wave moving out of the Rockies. A little bit of drying, and then we have the moisture return starting once again for Tuesday. But as we know, the upper level flow is going to be a little bit weaker. 
So the patterns may be a little bit more tropical going into next week. And you can see the gradients on the edges of this moisture field not very tight. So that indicates kind of an absence of upper level forcing. Anyway, the moisture continues flowing northward, so a lot of precipitation potential up into the northern plains later next week. And don't see any tightening of those gradients going into next week. That doesn't rule out the possibility of boundaries and fronts at the surface. But overall, it looks like the upper level support is a little bit weaker. And we should certainly point out that moderate risk. That's going to be it for tomorrow. A very large area. Basically, Emporia, Chanute, over to Dodge City, down to about Lawton, Altus, and back up towards Tulsa. So kind of a large area. The tornado risk is focused on the western part of that moderate risk. Wind threats up in the northeastern part. And hail just about everywhere. And the models are all over the place with the evolution of storms tomorrow. The HRW FV3 producing an isolated storm around Wichita Falls, tracking around Gainesville, Denton, maybe even Dallas. The 3-kilometer NAM going for a couple of specks out there around Wichita Falls, down to Ranger, and some sort of outflow-driven system across Kansas. The WRF ARW going for basically nothing at all. And quite often the GFS has the right idea. So you can see that we're going for something in South Oklahoma. So I would probably lean toward this for a solution for tomorrow. I might be thinking of a target around maybe Lawton or Ardmore. And the regular NAM not really showing anything. So a lot of questions about tomorrow, and there's really nothing we can do except start with the 12Z data tomorrow and see where we're at. Looking at the verification of the models for yesterday on that southwestern Oklahoma storm, none of them really managed to get this 12 hours out. Maybe the NAM 3-kilometer model, maybe got in the ballpark there a little bit, maybe the NISL HRW but the rest of them pretty far out. And you can see even in North Texas, a wide variety of solutions. And that underscores more than ever that if you're dependent on those models, you are not gonna be able to forecast very well. Those are some pretty significant errors. So you really have to have your forecast fundamentals down to be able to keep up with what's going on. Now, the models do pretty well with the synoptic scale picture, like what we see right here. It's the little mesoscale elements, like the MCSs. Those are where they are having trouble. So let's go ahead and look at the forecast over the next week. This should be reasonably close. And you're going to see that cold front sagging into Texas, the dry line backing up a little bit, and the return flow gets established for tomorrow. So there's 1 p.m., that's when the risk for thunderstorms begin to appear. And that will focus along that warm front. But again, we don't really know exactly how this is going to unfold. But synoptically, looking at the ingredients, front, dry line, triple point, yeah, we're probably going to be focused on that area right there. And there's that old saying by Tim Marshall, when it's May, you chase. In other words, you don't really have to be reliant on the models to tell you whether to chase or not. Very likely, the atmosphere is going to squeak something out, and that may be the case for tomorrow. So by tomorrow evening, the GFS going for that track there in southern Oklahoma. We saw that with that other product. So anyway, going into the rest of the weekend, this synoptic scale system will track into the Midwest region, carrying that warm front northwestward maybe some early morning thunderstorms around Illinois and Wisconsin, then things will shift into Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan. Cold front coming south, mostly dry, into the Ozarks. And now we have to shift gears and look at what's happening right now. We do have numerous storms across the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Looks like a lot of splitting going on. Don't have any strong, severe cells at this time, although most of them are severe warned. You can see one left mover right there, moving up towards the Denton area. And these others down to the south, those look like your classic right movers. We do have a couple mesoscale discussions, one up there for the Chicago, Rockford, Madison area. 
Isolated, strong, severe thunderstorms expected. You can see numerous cells out there west of Rockford and further south. A large cluster of storms up there north of St. Louis. In the Ozarks around Springfield, looking for severe thunderstorms through mid-evening. There's an MCS right there across the rugged terrain of central Missouri. And looks like a fairly substantial tropical layer across much of the southwestern part of the state down into northwest Arkansas. Looking at our forecast soundings, yeah, we can certainly do that. I do notice the high-resolution rapid refresh is picking up that convection there in Dallas. Let's switch over to the Theta E because we want to sample a non-contaminated parcel. So that's going to be the zero hour, one hour, two hour, and that's where we start to lay down some of that outflow, and we have to make sure we don't sample that when we look at the parcel. Anyway, let's go ahead and click on a parcel east of Dallas. Yeah, there's our sounding, some rather significant lapse rates. Cape, 4,000 to 5,500, so some very strong instability. There is curvature on the hodograph, very modest, and it appears the right mover and left mover are pretty much split across the hodograph. So, yeah, splitting storms will be an issue, but there will be a little bit of right dominance due to this higher SRH swept out right there. Not as much of that available for the left mover. The D-Capes, 1,200, so that's elevated. We're going to get considerable outflow interactions. And it's an uncapped air mass, convective inhibition values below, well, <laughs> pretty low there, near zero. So we're going to get numerous storms going up until we start losing the surface heating. So it's not 100% clear how all this is going to evolve. These uncapped situations are very difficult to forecast, especially when you have a lot of outflow being dumped across your target areas. But I think we're going to see this area kind of get shut down just a tiny bit and maybe a lot of this activity here becoming the dominant area for this evening. So that does spell maybe some trouble in this area if any of these storms do become severe, maybe even a little bit further south. So anyway, we'll see what happens, and I'm sure this is probably a difficult chase for any chasers that are out there. Dallas-Fort Worth traffic is, yeah, that's kind of a whole different thing there. All right. I need to go ahead and get this closed up and get this posted before the data all gets too old to use. And I know you all want to enjoy it and see what's going on. Anyway, that's all for this edition of Forecast Lab. Here is some footage from Greg. Thank you very much, Greg, for this uh, drone footage around San Antonio. Anyway, I hope you all have a great weekend. And uh, definitely pick up a book at weathergraphics.com, help support the program, or head to Patreon and help us out there. Anyway, whatever you can do will be appreciated. All right, we'll see you back here in a few days on Monday for the supporters and on Wednesday for everybody else. Have a good one. Bye-bye.